Ava Chen, welcome to the Motherly Podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here and apologies in advance for every kind of like <coughs> cough that I have. Yes, you have been in the thick of it with your kids as well. So I know you're a mom of three and I always like to ask our mm-hmm. guests what surprised them about motherhood. What what was that for you? What was most surprising about becoming a mother? Oh, like I guess that one part of my brain would always is just always focused on the kids like they're always kind of hovering in my heart in my mind or in like true physical proximity to me like right over my shoulder um for everyone listening you know it's been a really intense two plus years and for us it's been an intense two weeks because uh we've been in lockdown in isolation slash quarantine slash monitoring uh, with COVID, it kind of ripped through our households like wildfire. And um, so it's been a lot, but I guess, yeah, it's always how I, I, I can't think of those like moments where the kids aren't on my mind or I'm not thinking about something for them. And it's not just the kind of mundane prosaic things like, oh, don't forget to buy new pajamas. It's like just their larger well-being is always on my mind. And so that transition from being about yourself and your orbit being yourself into this like big universe of like kind of children uh, has been the most wonderful, all-consuming and exhausting surprise. Mm -hmm. What about the transition from two kids to three kids? You recently had your third child and Mm -hmm. I wonder what was one to two and like for you and what was different about going Mm -hmm. from two to three, especially during a pandemic? It's it's funny because I remember when I was pregnant with my second, so go that transition from one to two, I asked some of my friends and I had one friend who was like, oh my gosh, it was so easy. Like, don't even worry about it. Like, they'll entertain each other. It'll be great. Like, you got this. Like, thumbs up. And then I remember thinking as I was like, had two kids in diapers, both of them like nonverbal because my older one was only about 25 months when the second one came along. And I remember thinking like, this person lied. <laughs> like, this is so hard. And I, I don't know that I was properly warned mm. or like kind of, you know, I, I, just, I just wasn't anticipating such a big shift because I kind of went into, into one from one to two with the mindset of like, I've done this before. I know how to keep a kid alive. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize what would be hard or so hard was navigating two kids with such different schedules. Like, you know, it goes from... I was like pre-med, like many, 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 I guess, decades and eons ago, you know, moons such decades ago at this point. But I remember going from chemistry to organic chemistry and organic chemistry is like where the everything's like 3D. And that's what I felt like life Mm. became when I had two kids, where it was like not just a single plane of like, okay, like Ren's music class, like do this, that, this doctor's appointment. It was like two schedules putting in nap schedules, putting in different needs, like different levels of what they were able to eat, what they were able to handle, like physically. Um, And so I thought that transition was really hard. Like I I really struggled from one to two. And two to three, like, I don't know if I'm running on pure (laughs) adrenaline and fumes at this point. I am that like car that's just like, you know, there's smoke coming out from all the engines, but it's like, it's gonna make it, it's gonna make it. Um, I feel feel like it's been less hard and I wonder part of it has been the silver lining of COVID which in this awful you know terrible pandemic where it's just been so terrible like the one silver lining is that like I've seen the kids like Mm -hmm. grow up I've been able to spend more time with them and I wonder if what made it easier is the fact that like work started revolving around home life and it, home life wasn't something that was like bookended, but just like more consistent. And so the fact that I w- was home more, yes. I wonder if that helped more. I had like tough, not tough, but I went back to work pretty much immediately after my first two um, for various reasons. Uh, but with this one, it's like I really took a longer mat leave and... Um, I feel lucky to work for a company and you know, you know, from your partner, that's like very supportive for new parents. And um, I could say like, oh, I have a pediatrician appointment. Like I can't make this important call and people would be like, oh, we'll reschedule it. Or like, um, we'll fill you in after and like actually do so. So um, yeah, two to three has not been as 
challenging, but I also wonder if it's because mm. um, he's a better sleeper, he's a better eater. <laughs> like, he's my first two, I had like challenges in mm-hmm. different ways. And I love what you just said. I want to get it right, but about how this strange silver lining of this pandemic has helped um, work revolve around our lives in a new way. Um, is that something that you hope to keep going, like, if and when we ever get to this place of thinking about a post-pandemic world? Like, what does that tell you about what you want for your work and your family lives? That's a great question. I mean, I I feel very lucky and privileged to be in this kind of work situation where it can kind of, it's like if it's like a seesaw, it can sometimes seesaw to one side and that's okay and seesaw to the other and both will accommodate each mm-hmm. other. I know that's not the case for like, I would say like 99% of Americans. Mm-hmm. And that's a huge, you know, you know, issue that our, I mean, not to go into politics, but it's like a larger, the childcare issue is a larger one for that sure. we as a country have to address, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's like, it makes it impossible for working parents, especially working mothers. And it's why so many women have dropped out of the workforce in the last two years. Um, I would love to be able to continue this balance. Um, I would, uh, right now, um, my work, my main mm-hmm. work, not my book work, but my main work is still work from mm-hmm. home. Uh, for until mid-March. Um, and then I think we enter something called like a flexible work situation. And I plan to continue that where like maybe three days a week I'm working from home or two days a week from working from home and kind of take it week by week. I think that the old model of working where, especially if you're in like an office job, which I basically am, where you're like, okay, nine to five, you know, commute is this time, lunch is this time. And it's so structured. Yeah. I think that has gone by the wayside. I think that's, I think that's almost impossible mm-hmm. now. And for me now, it's like, there are all these things that I'm trying to prioritize. Like, it sounds so simple. And this, I, I joke that January was like my 30 day free trial <laughs> where it's like, I, January was a wash. I was like, so excited to like, I was like, yeah, I'm new exercising year, new and me. I'm going to stretch. <laughs> <laughs> new year, new me. I'm going to stretch every night before I go to sleep and I'm going to exercise. I'm going to work, do two workouts a week. It's going to be great. And like all of it went, you know, out the window because of COVID. Um, but I do want to like continue some of these like habits of like, I don't even call it self-care. I call it self-preservation. Mm-hmm. I feel like as women, we have to do some of these things because if you don't take care of the caretaker, like the caretakers have to take care That's of right. themselves too so that they have fuel to take care of, you know, their, Mm -hmm. their Mm -hmm. little ones, um, or whatever else is going on in their lives. So, yeah. Um, well, one of your many projects, of course, is a new children's book that we're really thrilled to talk to you about, um, called I am golden. Congrats on it. It is a beautiful book. You You have a, you have a copy. I have it right here. It is super beautiful. Um, and I wonder if it is the kind of story that you wish you could have read growing up. Oh, definitely. I mean, I grew up in the 80s and 90s. I'm Chinese, uh, which you could probably see. And, you know, growing up, I, I didn't really see any books that had covers that looked mm-hmm. like me. I didn't see any books. This book is very much about, like, the immigrant experience and like it's about being Chinese and feeling like you're between two worlds, which I very much felt like. And so I didn't have books like mm-hmm. this growing up where I literally so identified with the person on the cover. Um, I read a lot of books growing up with like kind of like plucky female protagonists like Ramona Quimby or, you know, all the Babysitter's Club girls. Uh, I mean, I love Hermione Granger. I didn't grow up with her. I was like 20 (laughs) when Harry Potter came out. But still, you know, like with these really strong female characters, but none of them looked like me. And so I wanted to create a book that um, young people could pick up and read whether or not they're Chinese and feel like an affinity towards if you've ever been bullied, if you ever felt like you're not sure where you fit in in the Mm. universe. Um, I wanted to create a joyful book because it's also been like a tough two years for the Asian community, Um, not just the Chinese community. Like even now there are horrific attacks uh, happening, especially on Asian elders, which is like, imagine even if you're not Asian, imagine your grandma literally being like 
hit on the head on the street just for walking down the street. It's terrible. And so I wanted to write a book that was an antidote to that in some small way that really had like a joyful, like kind of just a joyful mm. feeling to it. It's so joyful. The art as well is so poignant, so beautiful. It's so immersive. Um, and I was reading one of the pages uh, where you were describing the, the physical experience of being Asian and I'm going to read from it. I'd love it if you could also do a little voiceover here at some point after this interview. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm going to read the words and, and I would love you to tell me why it was so important to include them and hear the words. We see eyes that point towards the sun that give us the warmth and joy of a thousand rays when you smile. We see hair as inky black and smooth as a peaceful night sky. We see skin brushed with gold. Why, why, were, why was that description in this beautiful children's book like particularly important to describe in that level of detail? Um, well, first of all, thank you for saying that. Um, I just, I, I wanted to really verbalize like that things that people would consider differences as, as beauty. Um, for me, I, I, there's a spread in the book that kind of tackles bullying where people are, you know, are saying, you know, with one angry breath that you're not like one of them you, or you look different. And the other one is like, you can't be one of them. Um, and I remember that. I remember being like eight years old. I remember the exact schoolyard that I was in, you know, where someone pulled his eyes, the corners of his eyes at me. And, um, or I remember it was the same boy actually, uh, you know, in art class saying like, oh, I'm gonna draw your skin and I'm gonna draw it yellow because that's what you are. You're just like yellow. And, and saying it in such a negative way. And I was like eight, uh, which is Ren, my daughter is seven. And I just remember being really confused and kind of like, it's so, um, it takes away people's power. I, it wasn't something I'd ever thought about. I always felt like I fit in and I was just like another kid. And suddenly I was like othered. Mm. Um, and that, you know, I walk by that school. It's very close to the Meta Astor Place office. Like, so you mm -hmm. probably know the corner mm -hmm. that I'm talking about. And I can still see that schoolyard because it's like out on the street. And I walk by it and I'm like transported back to my eight, eight year old self. And so words matter so much when you're a kid. I mean, you have four mm -hmm. kids, you know that when you read them words, it's like every time you read them something or tell them something that affirms them as a human, that makes them feel seen, that makes them feel safe. I do feel like it's like you're kind of putting a seed in them or kind of like, you know, drawing a line in them that gets darker and darker mm. and darker until it's like part of them. Uh, and then like tattooed, hopefully not physically <laughs> an actual tattoo, but like not that there's anything wrong with tattoos, but mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Like that's in, like let's say you're imprinting mm -hmm. into them. And so I wanted to put it into words um, that someone's eyes, if they were different, looked mm -hmm. beautiful. Someone's hair, if they're dark um, and not light or not like curly, whatever it is, like, you know, that they're beautiful things and things to be mm -hmm. proud of. And I, I hope that my kids have this book as like a tool. I hope that teachers have it as a tool. Parents have it as a tool. Um, also to build empathy for kids who might be in their class that don't look like them mm -hmm. um, so that they understand the, the insecurities that they might be feeling about the way they look. You brought up talking about the violence that has been done in particular against so many elders within the Asian American community, um, you know, and the hateful environment that so many are facing. Um, but also in the book, you talk about the importance of ancestors. There's paintings of, you know, this character's ancestors. Um, can you talk about the role of one's elders and ancestors within Chinese culture and why what it represents, why it is so core to almost one's own identity. Mm -hmm. I mean, for in Chinese culture, like the elders, like, you know, your grandparents are like in this like vaulted kind of like honorable place in the family. Like one example I can think of is like, so my grandmother now, um, I only have one grandparent left. It's my grandmother, but she has advanced, advanced Alzheimer's where she's, you know, it's like with Alzheimer's by the end, it's like, they're not really there. They're physically there, but my, not, my grandmother, my grandmother suffered for about a decade, sort of fading away in such a similar way. She just died last mm -hmm. year, um, but in a very similar, um, 
haunted kind of experience that we yeah. went through too. And it's, it's, you know, it's heartbreaking because for me, my, I was really close to my grandmother growing up. It's, it's one of the reasons why with my mom and my kids, like I want them to spend as much time together as possible because those memories, I think really shape you. Uh, and they are mm. like your connection and living history. But I remember growing up, you know, we would have these big family dinners and what you would always do is you always had to offer the plate to the parents and the grandparents first because it, out of a sign of respect, mm -hmm. if there's one part of the food, like there's one part of fish, like you want the fish cheeks because it's the sweetest part, like mm -hmm. you'd always offer that mm. to the grandparents first. It's all about respect to, to elders. And so I think that's one of the reasons why when there are these attacks on Asian elders, which are still happening, it really galvanized the Asian community because it it really brought people together that's like, this is not right. Mm -hmm. And I do think there are a lot of um, historically like stereotypes that Asian people are more quiet or permissive or passive. And I think this really fire, fired up the community mm -hmm. to say, this is like really messed up and you're seeing people kind of step forward. I know for me, certainly the last two years has made me prouder, even, even more mm -hmm. proud and declarative in like, yes, I am Chinese American and I'm proud of who I am. And I'm going to kind of talk about these issues. I'm not going to like, just be quiet about them because we really do need um, change here. And we need people to accept this huge community in America. Um, so yeah, it's, it's been, it's been a tough two years for everyone. Um, but I hope that I hope that like I, I literally wrote this book after the Atlanta shootings uh, because I was just thinking about how I would talk to my kids about like my history, my parents' history. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the seed mm. of the book. You've also talked a bit about your parents um, and your, your mother in particular and her ambition, mm -hmm. her lived experience coming to the U.S. How did her mm -hmm. work ethic, as you've talked about it, um, her point of view on career, how did that shape you? And this really unique, multifaceted career that you've you've ended up with. My uh, mom has shaped me in so many ways. I mean, some of my earliest memories growing up, my mom and dad owned a small business uh, and it was around importing and exporting um, like textiles, accessories, like, you know, goods. And I remember traveling with my mom to Korea, to uh, everywhere from like as close by as Providence, Rhode Island, where we would take Amtrak together. Mm -hmm. uh, and she'd be looking at bearings and like kind of parts and mm -hmm. tools to Korea, uh, to doing these like larger meetings in Korea. And I remember traveling with her. And now when I look back thinking like, wow, my mom was traveling with like an eight or a 10 year old <laughs> girl by herself to like, you know, these far flung places, I would pack like a suitcase of books. Um, it's amazing, you know? And so I'm really proud of the fact that, uh, that I am my mother's mm. daughter. I like, I, I feel like I learned work ethic from both her and my father, but um, it really shaped me in terms of my work ethic and like feeling like wanting to set a positive example for my sons and daughters. And I say sons and daughters, because I think a lot of people pivot over kind of like index or pivot on like, oh, you have to be an example to your daughter, example to your daughter, but you want to raise sons who see what their mothers are passionate about too. Mm -hmm. You know, you want, uh, you know, I have a diff another book series that's all about feminism and like strong females. And I would have moms come up to me and say, you know, oh my, you know, my daughter loves the book. I haven't shown it to my son. And I'm like, you should, because like boys should grow up seeing how amazing women can be mm -hmm. and like what the trailblazers in history. Um, so I, I really try to approach things that way, like in terms of parenting, like making sure that Tao and River, my two mm -hmm. boys are exposed to things that like, to, to, to all the same things that Ren is and let them make the choice. Yeah, I totally agree. I find myself doing that too, because I have three sons. Go ahead. <coughs> I have three sons and a daughter and, um, you have, I have an instinct to kind of like do the feminist thing with my daughter, but realizing just as important for our sons to see like positive, strong male and female examples in their lives. Um, totally. And like my daughter, when she was a, a little girl, she went through a phase where she loved like fire engines and construction. And I was like, that's yes. awesome. And I remember like going all in on it and buying like, you know, 
like all her like little hoodie, you know, towel kind of like those bath oh yeah bath towels with the hoods yep. on them. She had one where when she hold, held her arms out, she was a fire That's engine, cool. and she's not so into it now. But you know, whatever phase they're in, like I, I want to be there mm-hmm. to meet them. Mm-hmm. You've already mentioned that at one point in your life you were pre med. So thinking of going to yes. medical school, and you mentioned, it sound, feels like many moons ago, but I'm curious, where did this part of you that is obsessed with fashion and style, um, presenting one's own identity in the way that you do through social media, where was the seed of that passion for you? Like, when did you first realize, okay, maybe it's not pre-med, maybe it's this other thing that I'm, that's inside of me? Oh my gosh. I feel like I've tried a gajillion things. And that's why when I talk to, you know, young women in their twenties, I'm going to cough one second. (coughs) So I feel like when I talk to young women, I like how, when I say young women now, it's like women in their twenties, those young women. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's happening. Um, But when I talk to them, you know, and they're like, oh, I'm 24 and I want to change careers. I'm like, dude, you can change your career like mm-hmm. seven times, mm-hmm. eight times, nine times. It should keep mm-hmm. changing. You should keep evolving as a human. Um, I know who I was like 10 years ago is not who I was like, you know, 20 years ago, who I am now. And I think uh, the seed for fashion really came from my mother again, because she always had uh, has such a great eye and I feel like was like ahead of the curve in so many ways. Um, and I remember going to Milan with her. She, there was like a big trade show convention in Milan. And so she would go, I would go with her. We would eat a lot of pizza and Mm. pasta, but I remember like, you know, kind of observing fashion and she just has a great instinct and a great eye. Um, social media for me, like Instagram for me started when I was working as an editor, uh, at Teen Vogue which was like my dream job because I was obsessed with like the OC and Gossip Girl Mm -hmm. and all those like CW and Fox shows. And I remember being, you know, going to these like events, these beauty events where there'd be a makeup artist and like one sentence the makeup artist would say would end up in the article I was writing. And I remember thinking like, I just want a place to kind of share all the extra. And I... And I, and I feel that way now still, like, I mean, I love Instagram. I'm pretty, pretty active mm-hmm. on it, uh, for better, or for worse. And I do feel like the reason I went into journalism and into like writing is because I always wanted to share my experience. And it's now even why, like, you know, even when I'm writing children's books, it's about sharing a message or experience. And so like, I, I really love sharing my day-to-day experience. And I, I get so much from the community, like, I feel like I learned how to be a mom through the help and collective Mm -hmm. wisdom of other Mm -hmm. moms. And so much of that was done on like in Facebook groups, like, you know, in Instagram DMs where people are sharing hacks for like, you know, for food. Like I'm trying to like teach my baby how to like Mm -hmm. eat right now, like Mm -hmm. solids. And it's like so many people sharing tips. And it's like the collective wisdom of women and mothers is so powerful. So, so powerful. I want to talk about that. But first, um, definitely have have to um, rabbit hole on mom influencers. I definitely am curious your point of view. But you are a real mom in the thick of it with three little kids. And yet you make it look glamorous. Um, So for those listeners who want to feel more like themselves in in the thick mm-hmm. of motherhood. Do you have any advice for how to think about getting dressed, developing a new sense of style in motherhood, which you have done and continued to evolve? Ooh, I mean, I don't know that that's fully true <laughs> in terms of like glamour and style. Um, I think I still find a lot of joy uh, in fashion and clothes even though right now like most of my life is like leggings slash sweatpants and then hopefully like a cute sweater or hopefully a cute top like literally in like gray sweatpants right now while I'm still in quarantine and one of my new year's resolutions that went by the wayside was like oh I'm gonna only wear sweatpants two days a week and I'm gonna wear like black Mm -hmm. pants or like but then I realized black pants when you're like 
dealing with a kid who's learning how to eat and he's eating yeah. purees. I'm like, black pants are the worst yeah. clothes to wear because one sneeze and your black pants are covered in like oatmeal or like scrambled egg or something. Um, I would say like, first of all, be patient and forgiving with yourself. Like if the one thing you're able to do for yourself that day is brush your hair or wash your hair, that's, that's mm-hmm. an accomplishment. Honestly, there are some days like, like I said in the beginning, like I've been in quarantine, lockdown, isolation, whatever, all the things for 10 days at this point. And it's, it was, it was a real struggle to wash my hair like two mm-hmm. or three times during that time, you know? Um, so be forgiving, try to claim like 15 minutes for yourself here and there. And if 15 minutes sounds like a lot or mm-hmm. not enough, like, you know, break it down. Like just say like, set your timer and say for five minutes, I'm not going to do anything for five minutes. I'm going to stretch for three minutes before bed. I'm going to read a book and find things that you can take for yourself. Um, be greedy Mm -hmm. for yourself, be greedy with yourself because I do feel like kids are emotional, like vampires, sponges, Mm -hmm. like not in a bad way, but that's like, they will always want more mommy time. They will always want it. Mm -hmm. God bless. Like, and you always, like, I always want to give it to them, but sometimes I, when I'm just at like zero, I'm like, I need a break. And I'll say to them, I think that's the other thing, telling your kids and making them aware, like, oh, mommy needs some quiet time. I will literally say that mommy needs some quiet time. Like mommy needs to like rest for three minutes. I'm going to set the timer. Mommy's going to lay down with an eye pillow. And then I'll like try to find like cute eye masks. You know, that back in the day when you used to fly, they gave out those eye masks I have like a whole like uh, like box of them and then like Tao my middle child will sometimes like take one and put one on and lay down and I'm like yes like yeah it's fun for him because he gets to do something silly and then I get to literally like sit in silence and like just like yeah collect myself. now that figuring out how to relax and do things that feel good to me with my kids that was like a mini breakthrough like it's not all about mm-hmm. joining them in their events or reading the like books that I don't enjoy reading with them it's finding ways to like make it feel good for me too and I think so many moms need that permission to do Mm -hmm. motherhood in ways that feel good to them totally like my kids will sometimes say mommy can you read me dog man and listen no disrespect (laughs) to Dave Pilkey because genius listen he sold like I think 300 million books or something like absurdly good for him like (laughs) go you but I will say to them, I'm like, mommy's not reading Dog yep. Man. Mommy will read you any of these 15 yes. books because mommy enjoys reading those 15 exactly. books. And I swear they're just not yep. my own, but mommy's not reading Dog Man tonight. That, the, we all need ever. boundaries. I love that boundary. Um, I'm right there. My kids are thick. <coughs> my kids are thick in the Dog Man phase of life. Um, yeah. So you work at Meta, uh, also known as mm-hmm. Instagram, Facebook. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And... I wonder what you've observed about the influence and rise of mothers on the internet. I think, you know, I'm 36 and Mm -hmm. over the last 15 to 20 years, we've gone from, you know, something that used to be called mommy bloggers, I think in a kind of put down kind of way around what women and mothers contribute online to like a massive ecosystem of mom influencers. Um, who are like some of the most popular, influential, um, creative group of entrepreneurs on the internet, really. Mm -hmm. Why do you think social media has been so powerful of a platform for mothers in particular? I think um, sometimes when you are a parent, you can feel like you have tunnel vision into your own four walls. Mm -hmm. You know, just trying to keep everything afloat. And life can feel like this never ending routine and grind, right? Like I'm thinking about the last two weeks where like every day I was like feed, <laughs> clean, like feed, survive, nap, like mm-hmm. not me. I wish the kids or my baby, like and it just feels very methodical. And I think that one thing that like, you know, the in the rise of parents as influencers and mom influencers and I follow a lot of accounts like do you follow Dr. Becky Gooden oh yeah we're gonna have her on the podcast later uh later in the spring 
I'm like totally. obsessed with her. So it's like accounts like Dr. Becky or like I follow Solid Starts mm-hmm. right now because my baby like is trying to like he he only wants to feed himself, <laughs> which is great. It's like it truly is baby mm-hmm. led weaning. Um, it's great, but it's also stressful because it's like all mm-hmm. over the floor. Um, and with accounts like that, so I think I think of it actually as beyond just like the mom influencers and also these accounts that kind of yep. cater and help and support. It's all about like I think taking those four walls away and like opening it up to this whole mm-hmm. new community, um, and the tips and tricks and tactics and also seeing that like okay someone else is going through exactly mm-hmm. what I'm going through and not to fangirl out on Dr. Becky but like you know when she talks you're like okay I'm not the only one with like you know uh, you know a child who's doing X mm-hmm. Y and Z or like it's so so helpful like I follow a lot of like my first two kids have always been pickier mm. eaters. And so like, whether it's an account like kids, I think it's called kids oh, yeah, eat in great. color. Account. What, you know, it's like, it, it, you see that and you're like, yeah. it's going to be okay. I can try these things. Um, and so I think it's all about finding support and support systems. And in this new world where, especially now you can't hang out with, I can't hang. I haven't seen like, I have all these like WhatsApp chats with like, these moms I've been friends with for years, but we haven't seen each other. And so that sense of connection uh, can happen on all different platforms now. And I love it. It's been so helpful for me. Speaking of the kind of parenting experts that you look to, um, I'm curious how you would describe your parenting style and if it's different than the parenting style your parents had and how you have worked through that. Mm. Uh, Yeah, it's, I would say pretty different. Um, I think my parents, they moved here in the 70s. They spent most of their, like when they were around my age, I'm like in my early 40s. Uh, No, no, I'm in my early 40s. It's great. (laughs) Woohoo! But like, I think that they did not speak the language. They still don't speak. Chinese is still Mm -hmm. their primary language. And they were focused on surviving in a new country where they didn't know the culture. And the emotional availability, I'll be honest, was like different. Like they, like I, I don't want to say smother my kids with like hugs and kisses, but I am very outwardly affectionate. Mm. I'm very like, I am always trying to make my kids laugh and I'm always trying to be Mm. goofy. Um, And it's something that I have, like, I think the freedom to do as being American, understanding the culture. And also like, it's a different time. You know, we have like, we now know a lot more about parenting and we spend more time thinking about, okay, like what works for Ren to kind of help her is X, (laughs) but what works for Tao is different. Whereas I think it's less one size fits all. Um, And so I I do think I have a different parenting style, but I have hopefully tried to take the best things from what like my parents always, like I always felt like loved and cared for, maybe not like, they never really emoted mm-hmm. it. And I was reading about, you know, like how there there's that theory about like the five different kinds mm-hmm. of love languages, like, you know, physical affection and gifts and acts of service. Like my parents are all about acts of service. And so it was less about like, great job. And it was more about here's a plate of fruit that we were putting in mm-hmm. front of you. Like, and that is our way to show we love you by taking the time to do this thing for you and to give mm-hmm. you this thing. Um, and I think that my love language is more like verbal and like kind of hearing it and like physical affection and I'm still trying to figure out what the love language is like I'm still trying to figure out how to do it best but um mm. yeah it it, 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 it is have you different talk- um, but it doesn't mean I wasn't loved by my parents it just means like they should have you talked to them ways. about that about your own journey from the way you were raised to oh, how you're raising your yeah. kids yeah you know what's you know what's funny it's like I'm always hugging Ren and I'm always saying like I love you like you know, you're doing great. And the other day, like we were, uh, my mom was over pre COVID. And I was saying like, I was saying to my mom, like Ren was like, why doesn't Popo, which is Chinese for grandma ever hug you? And I'm like, Oh, no, Popo like says shows she loves me in different ways. And I was like, but it would be nice to have a hug Mm -hmm. where I said something like that. And Ren was like, go hug your daughter right now and it was like so funny and then like so my mom came over and hugged me which is like super awkward and I hugged her and I was like oh my god I've been wanting this for so long 
I started crying and oh, she wow. started crying and Ren was like and now every time like my mom comes over Ren is like Popo, go give your daughter a hug or she'll be like mommy go give your mommy a hug and it's like so wow. wonderful to see and like wow. it's wonderful it's yes. all come full circle thank you to my I seven-year-old daughter um you also speaking of explaining things to your parents you have a job that like didn't exist when we were in when we were growing up and it's one of those jobs where you know you see memes about like I can't even explain what I do to my parents do you have do you have a vision of of what your career is in a way that has been the same across this time of things keep evolving and you're doing a job that didn't exist when we were growing up so how do you how do you define it Gosh, like if you had told me when I was like 15 years old and all gangly limbs and like trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, if you had told me that like, oh, you'd be working for this company where teaching people how to tell their story, I would be like, what? No, I'm going to be like a doctor. Um, And I've tried so many careers. As I said before, I was like pre-med. I worked at a law firm. I worked in PR, like obviously magazine editor, now in tech. Um, I don't really have like a long-term vision or plan for my career. I just feel like I will always try to follow where my interests mm. lie, like w- the direction that they're going. And generally, like if I feel myself, like feel nervous or like, oh my God, I have, like what am I doing? Like, it's usually a mm. good thing because it means that I'm like excited about something. So reading my own uh, cues, I guess, and butterflies are a good mm-hmm. thing for me. Um, <coughs> I would say... Um, you know, I think there are constantly ways to evolve. Like I've been talking with like one of my best friends from college who was my roommate and she and I, like for the longest time, like we always text about books. We both love historical. Oh my God, me too. Novels. That is my like, core category of books. Okay. okay. Historical okay. romance like, novels. <laughs> like, have you read Lisa Claypas? Like all no. of those books you have to read. I'm writing it down. It's called the ser- Okay. The series is called the Ravenels, okay. which is like the best name. And there are like 15 of the books and I, have you read the yeah, Bridgerton of course. books? Like, okay. So did it make you want eight kids? Cause it yeah, made me well, want eight kids. I, I would like a fifth kid, but the fourth kid has made things challenging. So, but yes, absolutely. So like that genre. So my, my friend Lauren and I That's are constantly hilarious. texting and we'll be like, Oh, you have to read this. And then I was like, I've always wanted to do a book club and I'm like, I should do a book club and I want to like interview oh romance gosh, novel, yes, please do like that. authors, <laughs> you know? And then like, so I don't know. There are always, and she's a stay at home mm-hmm. mom. She's brilliant. She's like one of the smartest, like she went to Hopkins with me. She went to med school and it's like, now we're talking about like, how do we do a book club or something? So it's like just trying new things and having fun with it. Um, something that I always that want to goals be doing. for all of us. Well, at motherly, We believe that motherhood brings out our superpowers. Um, I define them as forces, um, skills, things within us that we often didn't know were there until we became mothers. So I'm curious, what do you see as your superpower? Um, Well, this is a very hard question. I could say I wish my superpower would be like to be able to stop mm-hmm. time like all around mm-hmm. me so that like everything else stays still and then I can like do that everything. That would be a good one. We all have that. <laughs> yeah, we all have that corner. I have a corner of my apartment that I look at and every time I look at it, it's like seven boxes just full of stuff. And I'm always like, mm-hmm. Ugh, I want to like stop time and like spend a day organizing mm-hmm. this section. Um, I think my current superpower is just like, I hope that I can like help people, you know, find the thing about themselves that they feel good about. Like whether there are kids, I love reading to kids. I love doing school presentations to kids. Mm -hmm. It brings me so much joy to like, you know, work with children and talk with children. But um, right now my single, I would say my superpower is just surviving Mm -hmm. right now. Like since we are on day 12 of COVID and like, you know, I'm still recovering. And my husband was like, Ooh, my throat oh, is no. starting to like feel scratchy. He's the last yeah. man standing. And he's like, randomly, he's like, my foot aches. I think it's COVID. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> pretty sure the CDC doesn't have that in their like list of symptoms, but okay. Um, so right now I feel like my superpower hopefully is just like surviving, 
get getting to mm. spring but yeah I and that is a lot know. with your book tour three kids full-time job Ava Chen thank you so much for joining us on the motherly podcast thank you so much for having me